involved in doing some research involved in doing some research um, on issues relating to education, things that you've been studying this semester. And she asked me to give uh, a guest lecture on a topic of my choice, given that you seem to have worked through most of the syllabus at this point. And what I thought I'd do is introduce something that uh, is relevant to the kind of philosophical work that you've been doing this past semester, looking at people like Dewey and Barnett, and folks like that. Um, but trying to add a kind of sort of counterbalance to this philosophical approach, which is to think about educational institutions in their sort of historical grounding and to think about how the kind of ideals that philosophers discuss um, emerge from different historical contexts and get sort of taken up and recombined in interesting ways. So what I'll do is look at the university as a particular uh, educational institution to do this kind of work, but we could think about other um, learning venues, more traditional schools, non-traditional schools, things like that. So what I'll be doing today is giving a kind of history of the university, and hopefully we'll have some time for discussion at the end because SAS, as I'll try and mention, is uh, standing in a kind of creative relationship to this history. And it's worth reflecting on what kind of institution SAS is and where it might fit into this history. So to sort of set a kind of agenda, we have you know, many things in mind when we think about universities. Uh, here we have Moscow State University, a sort of amazing architectural feat, uh, very impressive. Here we have a library at the um, Eternity College in Dublin. Uh, some might think of this when it comes to universities. But what we'll be doing today is get a better sense of sort of what goes on in the modern university or higher education more generally. Um, think about what universities can and have achieved in the past as compared to other areas of society. And then finally, uh, tell a story focusing on some of these ideals. And hopefully these will resonate with some of the things you've been talking about over the course of the semester. Now, I'm gonna pose some rhetorical questions now, and maybe we can come back to this when we uh, have time for discussion at the end of the lecture. And I'll do my best to keep my eye on the clock. If, you, uh, if I'm running out of time, just interrupt me and let me know. Um, but it's worth thinking about what makes a university distinct or what is a university? Uh, so something maybe to think about now and return to at the end of this lecture is to imagine yourself in an unfamiliar place, a place you've never been before, say Africa, Mexico, New Zealand, you know, anywhere around the world, and you come across something called a university. Think about what you would expect to find there, uh, what kind of people you would expect to find there, and what kind of activities you would expect to be occurring there. As we'll see in the course of this lecture, these might seem like very obvious answers, but um, different visions of the university uh, imagine what goes on there, what the essential purpose is quite differently. Um, but it's worth thinking about what makes the university distinct? Uh, what is the university good at doing in a way that stands out from, let's say, a private company a government entity, um, an informal social club? What is it about the university that makes it distinct? What are the goods that it produces? Um, why is it better at producing these goods than other areas of society? And something we can think about at the end of the lecture is whether some historical answers to these questions still obtain today, or whether the function of the university in some significant regards has changed and certain things that it did well in the past and no longer uh, has the capacity to do well or is required to do well to achieve various social functions. So what I'm gonna do today, and I circulated a um, reading that maybe you've had a chance to read. If not, you can return to it after this lecture, which tells a certain kind of history of the university. And it tells this history by looking at various ideas. Uh, sort of strong shaping assumptions about the nature and the purpose of the university. 
So I'll speak to five of these ideas and hopefully you'll recognize aspects of them in SAS or the broader University of Tumim or other educational institutions you've been a part of. Um, and also you can think about how they help shape your thinking about higher education or some of the topics you've been discussing this semester in the abstract. Um, these, I apologize for the animation, it's just something to liven up the lecture a little bit. These ideas are normative, which is to say they're in various ways describing how universities should be and what they should be doing. They're not descriptive of any particular institutions of what they actually are doing. So there might be various universities um, that espouse these ideas that if you were to describe what they're actually doing, they're doing something quite different. But what I'm looking at is these normative ideas, how universities think of themselves as uh, achieving certain ends or um, fulfilling certain strong ideals. Now, these ideas are all answering a sort of similar cluster of questions. What's the purpose of the university? Why is it worth defending when it comes under some kind of threat? And if it's going to uh, persist in a changing world, what value should guide its adjustment or development? There are, um, there's a sort of famous figure that was told by a guy named Clark Kerr, the University of California president in the 1960s that said, you know, of the roughly 75 or so institutions that haven't significantly changed their form since, say, the 1400s, universities make up 60 or 65 of them, the vast majority. The Icelandic parliament, various banks or other ones, but universities have stuck around for a long time in more or less uh, the same recognizable form. But given sort of rapid technological changes, given other kinds of things that are going on in the world, there are a lot of questions today about whether the university uh, can still persist in the same form. And if it's going to change and develop, what are the ideals that are going to guide that? So again, there's an optional reading that can speak to some of these ideals if you wanna circle back to them with a little more uh, references and, and historical grounding. Okay, so in telling the story, I'll, I'll sort of tell, uh, we're given account of five ideals of the university. And for each account, I'm going to also give who is the imagined hero of this form of the university. So first ideal, something that might spring to mind if you've you know, watched Harry Potter films and have seen uh, Cambridge and Oxford or Harvard University, which is here on the left, is the idea of the university as uh, what is called a refugium or a humanistic enclave. And this is the university as imagined by proponents of the liberal arts. The idea for this kind of university emerges from its medieval origins in Bologna and Paris and other uh, old universities in Europe. And the idea is that the university stands apart from society in very significant ways. They stand apart from the authority of the church, the state, and the economy, because students and faculty are trying to devote themselves to learning, and they want to do so in peace from these various worldly concerns. In early universities, students were subject to different legal codes from the state or the territory that they happened to be studying in. Um, they had a certain kind of sustaining economy that was different from the general economy. And the idea is that universities are um, a preserve from the sort of more worldly affairs that concern us on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, initially this had a very uh, sort of religiously inflected purpose because society was obviously much more re re religiously inflected back then, um, but it expanded to include what are now called the liberal arts, which are very central to SAS. And the liberal arts essentially are, um, subjects and a curriculum that are worthy of free men. The idea is that we studied the liberal arts in order to attain a certain kind of freedom. We do this by exempting ourselves from the utilitarian concerns of the world outside the university, of money-making, of um, sort of power politics and that kind of thing. The university follows a very different logic. It's about education for its own sake, and the idea is that this kind of education forms character in a certain way. 
Uh, John Henry Newman, who wrote a very famous book called The Idea of a University, called this the education for gentlemen, people who are able to, again, stand above these worldly concerns and uh, sort of reap all of the rewards of character that come from studying a liberal arts curriculum. And what this really means is that you have a sort of spiritual, emotional, psychic freedom from the grubbier aspects of society. Now, the hero of this model is the student. Uh, it's the gentleman, as Newman says, who's at the center of this. It's not the faculty, it's not the state, it's not the economy. Um, it's sort of the process of learning that is centered here. And you'll find this model uh, at SAS, but also in many of these so-called small liberal arts colleges in the United States and Great Britain. And features of this include very small class sizes where care is really given to student learning. Uh, there are discussion-based classes, students are allowed to develop their own interests. And again, the idea is that the formation of the student in the sort of spirit of free learning, exempted from the concerns of the external world are at the center. So it has a very sort of uh, community-based spirit. And as I said, there are many colleges that uh, profess to uh, provide this model of education in the United States, Great Britain, and some places in Russia as well, it's only college up to a point, then SAS. So that's one model, one you might keep in mind, and one that, you know, if someone were to ask you what is a university, it might conjure up these kinds of ideas. Uh, and as I said, those have a very, very long lineage going back to the medieval universities of Europe. But as we enter the sort of uh, age of the nation state in the 19th century, another model emerges. And this is the idea that the university is somehow not just involved in training gentlemen, you know, for their own spiritual uplift. Uh, now the university is seen as being somehow related to the project of building, maintaining, and growing a powerful state. And this model we could call the university as an institution engaged in civic training. Here you have the University of Virginia, uh, which was in large part imagined and founded by Thomas Jefferson, uh, an early president of the United States, who had in mind the university as being Directly, relate, directly related to the growth of this, um, of this new state. So in the university as sort of an institution devoted to civic training, we're no longer isolated from society, but in some significant ways directly related to it. And knowledge here is not important for its own sake. It's not virtue in some abstract sense that we're after, um, rather what, this university tries to develop is civic virtue. The necessity of thinking outside of your own narrow sectional interests that comes from your family background. And to think about how to identify your interests with the community at large. This grows one's capacity to be a leader. So the university should produce uh, leaders, you know, people who are capable of exercising civic virtue in a leadership capacity but it's also useful for anyone to go to an institution like this because it allows you to become uh, worthy citizens, people who can appreciate the rights that come with citizenship, but also the responsibilities that come with citizenship as well. And this Jefferson sort of puts at the center of the University of Virginia. Now, the hero of this model is no longer the student devoted to learning in isolation, but rather the hero for this model is the citizen, which one might sort of extrapolate and say that is uh, the general social good becomes the, the hero of this model. That's what it's meant to produce. As uh, the historian Russell Nye reports, in the early American colleges, we had a primarily religious aim. But again, in the 1800s, as the United States develops into a strong nation, another sort of impulse emerges and that's to produce useful patriotic citizens. And you see versions of this happening in Germany as they become a modern nation state and other uh, nations, again, who enter the sort of post-Westphalian order of nations in the 19th, 19th century. Now, um, apologize for the animation again, but uh, this model is very present here in the United States and probably in Russia to some extent as well. 
in the development of public universities, universities that are funded by taxpayer money and that uh, serve various public purposes. Um, and they all, if you look at their literature, their mission statements, things like that, they'll all use this term of citizenship and they'll all talk about these civic virtues. Now they might add something about not speaking just to the civic virtues of the local community, but to produce global citizens. But it still has this idea of having you think beyond your own narrow interests and identifying sort of a learned, like a learned person with a, um, an ability to think about general social goods. And in some places you can see very directly uh, sort of universities that are almost explicitly devoted to training people in civic virtue. Uh, in France, for example, the vast majority of government leaders and leaders in the highest echelons of society come from what are called grand écoles, which essentially train future leaders. So that's model number two. So the gentleman is the hero of the first model of the enclave in the civic uh, university. It's the citizen or the future leader. But as not only the nation state develops, as the, the modern capitalist economy starts to develop, um, you also get a third model emerging, which is the university as a place where advanced vocational training occurs. And this emerges primarily in Germany and then spreads throughout the world. Now, the vocational university is all about giving students practical skills. And this means skills that can be put to economic use for the most part. An early president of Harvard, Charles Eliot, wrote that if well organized with a broad scheme of study, uh, it being a university education, can convert the boy of fair abilities and intentions into an observant, judicious man, well informed in the sciences which bear upon his profession. So train the graduate will rapidly master the principles and details of any actual works, and he will rapidly rise through the grades of employment. Moreover, he will be worth more to his employers from the start than an untrained man. So the university produces educated workers, which are capable of advancing an economy because they are uh, trained in certain technical capacities, whether in engineering or the sciences or now in computer programming, for example. But they're also able to learn how to learn so that once they're in their professions, they know how to apply their knowledge in new ways and develop those professions. And with a vocational university, you move away from a focus on sort of a more classical education rooted in the humanities and history and that kind of thing. And you bring in new, more professionally oriented disciplines. So to give you a sense of what this uh, looks like here in the United States, the most popular major by a wide margin at this point is business. So most students come to the university explicitly with the purpose of um, developing skills that will help them get a job in the future. The second most popular, uh, and this is partly related to the kind of insane healthcare um, system we have in the United States, is uh, the second most popular major is in the health professions, because this again is probably the most direct path to employment for lots of people. It's only after this that we get the sort of vestiges of older humanistic majors like history. And then we come again, right back to more practically oriented studies in biology, engineering, the performing arts, and then communications. Now, in this model, the hero is again, the student, but not the student as, you know, potential free man who needs to be elevated by their education, but the student as future worker, which is to say, the economy is in some roundabout way the hero of this university. And you'll see this model in many large universities around the world. There has been a rapid growth in professional schools, like business schools and schools of engineering. I live uh, a 10 minute walk away from the University of Pennsylvania, and they have a very famous business school called Wharton. And Wharton is, uh, along with the hospital, sort of slowly taking over the whole university. It's where all of the growth is occurring. And you see this as reflecting this kind of general idea that uh, higher education should in, should in some way be preparing people to engage in economic life. Now, moreover, that like there's the student being trained to be a future worker, but uh, a sort of offshoot of this approach has also been to 
refashion universities themselves into important economic actors. Uh, again, speaking to the University of Pennsylvania near where I live, they're one of the largest employers in the city of Philadelphia. Um, and they have a, a direct sort of bearing on the economy of the city. So universities not only train future workers, but are involved in um, economic activity. Uh, to give you a sense of what this looks like at the highest levels, some of the wealthiest universities in the United States have something called an endowment. It's just uh, money that they have that they invest as a sort of what they actually do with it is a controversial thing, but um, it's just sort of money on hand that they have. And they're more than most nations. Um, right now, Harvard's endowment uh, is estimated at 53.2 billion dollars, which is more than the gross domestic project product of many nations. And to give you a sense of what that looks like in rubles, it's an astronomical number. Um, so the third model has the university emerging as a key player in developing economies. Two more to go. The fourth one, the universities also become centers of disciplinary research, specialized research in a variety of fields. So in this kind of model, the university has well-defined departments, a department of economics, department of mathematics, department of biology, philosophy, history, Slavic studies, German studies, theater. And all of these are in some sense developing questions and forms of knowledge internal to their own disciplines. And universities are very effective at doing this. They have all kinds of um, professional societies and opportunities to publish and circulate your research with other people in your discipline. And the idea is that the university is a kind of engine for knowledge creation, not just for an economic or political purpose, but knowledge creation satisfying things that are important to specific disciplines. So if you are an evolutionary biologist, uh, having departments of biology, and allowing biologists to do research on the theory of evolution, circulating that research amongst other biologists, having conferences, uh, publishing in journals, this advances the science in that particular field. And you can imagine that occurring in any given field, something as esoteric as like theater studies or something as directly applicable to the economy as an economics department. But the idea is that the disciplines themselves are uh, sort of setting their own agenda and uh, given academic freedom to pursue the questions they deem discipline, or sorry, they, they deem um, important, they can advance their discipline and produce new knowledge. And with the growth of this model, we also see a massive amount of investment in research as opposed to teaching. In these early humanistic or on teaching, students in order to form their character in certain ways. Here, the focus shifts a little bit towards research, towards the faculty member as the producer of new knowledge. So the hero of this model is the professor as researcher. And here we have new categories emerging like the scholar, not the teacher, but the scholar. That's what a professor is, or the scientist. And the idea is that if these scholars are given a certain amount of academic freedom, if they're held responsible by other community members in their discipline, then they can keep advancing the frontiers of knowledge within their particular field. And again, the professors at SAS are asked to do um, interdisciplinary research, but in some ways that's dependent on having some sort of disciplinary uh, grounding before you enter SAS. We can talk about what this looks like there in a little bit. And this kind of uh, research model is very prevalent in the United States, but uh, it's really worldwide at this point as faculty are often evaluated less by um, metrics of how well they are at teaching and more by how much knowledge they're producing, how effective they are as researchers. And finally, fifth model, the corporate university. And this is a more recent development. Uh, I mean, SAS is a kind of interesting example here because it's literally built in some former corporate offices. So it has a sort of new look to it. It's not the same as these old Gothic buildings. Uh, it might have more glass, for example. Now, the corporate model of the university um, 
is a model that has a lot of applied programs and links with the outside world. Uh, to quote from the reading that I circulated earlier um, by Jeffrey J. Williams, a great sort of historian and commentator on the modern university. He says this model fully integrated the university with the so-called military industrial complex of the Cold War years. And now it's integrated with the overall corporate complex, not so much rocket science anymore, but big pharma, agribusiness, and what some people call the health industrial complex, which is to say this model is uh, firmly integrated in shaping the future development of the economy, not in just training future workers, but in having kind of direct functional relationships with various industries. And this involves certain things like what's called technology transfer, making sure the knowledge that's produced in universities is then moved out into the private sector. And also it has a shift in how students are seen. And we see the emergence as the student being treated more as a consumer than as a, uh, again, gentleman, future citizen, future worker. It's a different kind of relationship. Now in this model, we have a very different hero emerging. It's now not the student, it's not the faculty member, it's not the general social good. Here you have the entrepreneurial administrator emerging as the hero. These are people who can organize great sums of money and talent and knowledge and put them to creative productive use by making connections between the university and uh, various stakeholders outside the university. And if one can satisfy these various stakeholders, say bring in research revenue from the state, from the private sector, make connections with uh, power players in society, then you're deemed a sort of successful and canny administrator. And like large corporations, um, this requires you know, a different kind of skill set than the researcher who's you know, cloistered in their laboratory or study researching old texts. Uh, now you're sort of out there in the world. And there's many examples of this kind of university. Um, to give you a few examples from the United States, uh, MIT uh, is the producer of all kinds of cutting edge knowledge, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And it's uh, in some ways functionally related to a lot of computer companies that grew up in the 70s, what's called the Route 128 corridor. A similar thing occurred on the West Coast around Stanford University and the development of Silicon Valley, where knowledge produced in the university, communities gathered by the university, actually helped give rise to um, this new emergent field of um, electronics and digital communications and computing. And there's other areas uh, right now that are engaged in this, for example, in North Carolina around Duke University and the University of North Carolina. Uh, they're in called, in, involved in what's called the research triangle, which not only is producing research in the university, but is attracting new businesses to, uh, in some ways, benefit from that research. And you could even see this in some ways, if you um, go to uh, Moscow, for example, Yandex has you know, a little sector where their headquarters are, and they call that a campus. And it's the same if you go to uh, Google. Google calls their headquarters in California a campus. And you can see this as a sort of example of the modern research university. Now, so to summarize, we've got five models. They all, again, emerge at specific historical periods in time and are responding to some powerful forces in society, um, whether those are religious, whether those are related to the nation state, related to the development of the economy, related to the explosion of knowledge production that universities are at the center of, or related to the emergent er er um, areas of society that are having the most profound shaping effects. Uh, we get sort of ideals that emerge out of all of these. And if you go to any given university today, you'll probably find a sometimes complementary mixture of these, but oftentimes a sort of confused mixture of these. Uh, where some are sort of operating out of date. But they're all meant to be exemplary. So these are all speaking to the university being able to achieve certain things if they can live up to ideals that they've set themselves. 
what we have today, as I mentioned, is, um, you know, given that we've inherited this history, we have institutions that are a mix of these. And as I said, in some cases, this is a quite healthy and productive mix. But in many cases, these models don't sit very neatly with each other. And we get a lot of talk of the university being in crisis, of it not having uh, any one strong ideal that it can organize itself around. Rather, it has aspects of these various ideals that it can't fit together. And there's a growing body of discourse. And I think you've discussed a little bit of this earlier in the course about the university being in some sort of state of crisis or learning you know, being in some state of crisis due to the uh, non-harmonious way that these ideals have been, have been um, brought together. So I'll conclude my lecture in just a moment. Okay, we're getting time. Um, just to have you reflect on what you think SAS is, how it fits into these various models, um, how it's using some of these, how it's deciding not to use some of these, and whether you think there's anything occurring there that might be pushing into new territory. So maybe we can take this up in the conversation period. Uh, but I'll end with just a couple further reflections, then I'll stop in just two minutes. Um, there are certain things that are constant when we think about universities uh, that we've inherited and that sort of persist through all of these models. They all tend to involve students of one sort or another. And for the most part, this means younger people. Um, so that's something that persists through all these models. They carry certain traditions that are um, odd and very slow to be abandoned. If you go to a graduation in the United States, all of the faculty will dress in ways that are reminiscent of faculty in the uh, earliest universities in the 1300s. We have certain markers, like when you finish your degree, you get a diploma. And here's my master's diploma, which is still written in Latin, right? Just to show how uh, important this tradition is for certain uh, parts of the university. And then you also have things like classrooms, right? These are kind of things that don't tend to go away. Other things, academic freedom, self-governance, right? These are all things that uh, we've inherited from this history and people are still very, very committed to. So this tradition that I've been outlining today, this history, um, again, has persistent effects and captures our imagination when we're thinking about universities. But we're in a position today where people are wondering whether some of these traditions are still worth defending or whether we might need to think about the university in a new way. And I'll end with a quote. It's not related to universities, but it's related to this uh, question of how tradition and history weighs on the minds of the living, especially in areas in, in eras of crisis, as one might describe our era today. So it's a quote, it comes from Marx, uh, the 18th Brumaire of Napoleon Bonaparte. And I'll end with this and think about this in terms of the preceding history I've just sketched. So Marx writes, men make their own history, but they do not make it as they please. They do not make it under self-selected circumstances, but under circumstances existing already, given and transmitted from the past. The tradition of all dead generations weighs like a nightmare on the brains of the living. And just as they seem to be occupied with revolutionizing themselves and things, creating something that did not exist before, precisely in such epochs of evolutionary crisis, they anxiously conjure up the spirits of the past to their service, borrowing from them names, battle slogans, and costumes in order to present this new scene in world history and time-honored disguise and borrowed language. So I'll end there asking you whether you think this history that I've sketched weighs like a nightmare on the brains of you who are helping to sort of forge and pioneer this new institution, this new university at SAS, um, and whether in these times of crisis you're able to forge a new path or whether you find yourself in significant ways borrowing from these models that come from the past. Okay, so I'll end there and hopefully, I'll stop sharing my screen. Hopefully we still have a little bit of time for discussion. I know we had a delay, so maybe um, 
we might be a little short, but I'd be open for the remainder of time to, to have a, a back and forth with you. Thank you, Mike. It was amazing. Does anyone except for me has questions? Yep. Uh, hello, Michael. Uh, I'm Marina, the fourth year student. Thank you for the lecture. I have a quick reflection on your question about like uh, models and essays. And actually a quick question, starting with the reflection, I suppose it's, uh, it's interesting that in SS we have this combination from uh, student-oriented education uh, in which we have still small groups and uh, a lot of our uh, like classes is based on discussions between students. But uh, one, of the, uh, one of the important feature uh, of essays uh, actually is that all our professors are researchers, so they are scholars. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because sometimes it seems to me that all our professors are overwhelmed with, uh, like with both teaching and research at the same time. And then it's, it's like uh, interesting to see and actually, I heard the critique of some professors that while they are good researchers, uh, like hopefully they are not good in teaching and it's difficult to, to grab the material from them while you are studying uh, in the course. And it's interesting that maybe, maybe it, it's like a coin with two sides because on the one hand, uh, like uh, studying with researcher gives students the opportunity to be like, uh, how to put it, like to, to know all the new information and new invention in, in the discipline and in science. But on the other hand, you might got like the very good researcher as a professor who would be not like a good professor in essence just because it's not his or her specialization. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, like uh, an interesting, I suppose, aspect of essays that it might be ambiguous for different students uh, according to their like uh, student path uh, and uh, like precise professors that they had during the learning process. And also, I, I, I had a quick question because we, we discussed, we not discussed, but we, we heard about five models of university. And I'm interested in, uh, you said that a lot of universities now, it's a, a kind of mix of different models. And I'm interested in, uh, in a way, could the university now be the pure model, like one of the types? Because, for example, I, I'm thinking about the first model, which is uh, which was called Ubejeshe in Russian on your slide, and it's very like romantic idea. Uh, I believe like really romantic idea of university when you're in isolation and you are just learning and studying and so on. But it it seems non-realistic in in the modern world. Mm -hmm. Yep. So maybe maybe some another uh, models might be like pure uh, pure models and function in modern world or we we always need some mix yeah yeah no that's great thank you for the question and for your first reflection let, let me talk first about your comment then i'm going to answer your question i think you're very right to identify a certain sort of tension at sas where the faculty are asked to do research at a very high level and fulfill that function, but also teach. And in Russia, teaching is a very intense process because you have so much class time. You meet much more than we do. Um, so it takes a lot out of professors to teach and you, know, you only have so much energy, so it's hard to do both. And the way that is often resolved here is that uh, in graduate school, the idea is that the students sort of study along with the professors as they're doing research. This is where the idea of the seminar emerges. So 
the students are learning because they're, they have a front row seat to professors doing cutting edge research in their field. And this trains them to enter the field. So that's a sort of like specialized training in the disciplines. That's a little less appropriate at the undergraduate level because the idea there is usually not specialization. It's usually to get a much wider kind of learning and a different kind of teaching is required to give someone that kind of wide learning. And I think, you know, again, SAS does, they're doing a very um, interesting and ambitious and complicated, uh, they have a complicated model. And again, they sometimes achieve this well and sometimes not. There are also institutions, there um, is something called the School of Advanced Studies at Princeton, which is just faculty not doing any teaching whatsoever. It's a pure research arm of the university. And that's the sort of furthest extreme where you separate out learning and teaching altogether. But to your question, I think you're absolutely right that this romantic idea of just learning for its own sake is something that is really uh, vanishing from the landscape of higher education. And if anyone is able to achieve that, it usually means that it's, uh, they're very expensive. They probably have a lot of economic means that free them up from these um, worries about making money and you know, engaging in, in the economy. And in that sense, that kind of humanistic enclave is still available. It's just not available in a kind of democratic sense. It's reserved for a certain kind of elite in society. And in that sense, it actually is quite, we're kind of returning to the origins of that model because the sort of education for free men, this humanistic enclave was at that point also reserved for elite, you know, just men, you wouldn't have been allowed to study in that form. Um, so I think you're right that it's vanishing for a variety of reasons and it's returning kind of to its origins and whether we want to uh, lament that I think is something we, we could talk about more. Yep, and I have a quick response on your response because mm -hmm. uh, I believe in in the, in the SAS we still have this implementation of this idea of ubiejeshe, because uh, like I believe Andre's speech that the only thing that we can do during the quarter quarter as a students uh, is to study actually and nothing else because we are like we are students we should study and I know several people who go to the academic life, uh, not because they do not want to study, but because they need to work in order to live during the quarter and yeah. um, be allowed to study in economic terms. And I suppose it's also an interesting tension because uh, while we have like, uh, we, we do not have an opportunity as an institution to provide like some scholarship for every student to like do not care about about the living at all but uh, at the same time we we attended to uh, we attended to implement this idea of ubiejeshe and this idea of student who are just studying and do not do anything else while he is studying and i believe it's it's problematic because it's still goes to the social inequality in the end of the day and uh, different opportunities of different people to study or not study while mm -hmm. they're like 20 years old. Yeah, thanks. I think that's a very well said. I agree with the sentiment. Yes, yeah, so thank you for your presentation. I'm Nastya, the fourth year student as well. And I, um, I want to ask you about the critical pedagogy and uh, what you think about it in light of uh, these models. So do you think that it suggests like a different uh, type of model or is it more close to the civil training? Uh, because on the one hand, uh, it is oriented on like producing the active like citizens who will, um, I don't know, like undermine uh, oppression and so on but yeah. on the other hand we cannot say like th that the state uh, would be like the hero of, of that model yeah thank you Nancy. that's a great question there is a 
I didn't talk about universities, for example, in like South America, which are much more informed. So that's kind of where critical pedagogy emerges in Brazil um, and, you know, coming out of the third world. And that's a different kind of model of the university, which is, as you said, kind of adversarial or not, you know, directly in line with the goals of the state or the dominant sector in society. Rather, it's either, you know, standing up for the oppressed and Paulo Freire's framing, or it's trying to maintain a essentially critical function that it's all like, it's, it's the space that's reserved in society for powerful critiques to be made against authority and against power. And if you go to some universities in South America, it's kind of, there are sort of like free zones. Um, so they're not set aside in the humanistic sense of like being isolated just to learn. They're places of intense political activity, but like, you know, state actors don't tend to go in there as much. Um, they're, they're places that are sort of marked as adversarial, which is why, you know, in periods of conflict, they're, you know, targeted and sometimes there are even, you know, battles that emerge at universities, Mexico City, for example. Um, but that would be another kind of model. It's, it's interesting. Uh, how that model can sustain itself because it's gonna elicit the most sort of um, pressure from external forces. Uh, but there does seem to be something about the spirit of universities that does tend to give rise to that kind of critical model. And it might be partly a function of the fact that universities gather lots of young people who sit at a kind of um, interesting liminal space between like, they're not full members of society. They haven't fully bought in, uh, but they're also not, you know, children who are dependent on their parents anymore. They're in this sort of middle zone. So that tends to breed a certain kind of criticism of the existing order and the imagination of other orders. So I think that's a good suggestion that that could be like a sixth model that one could add. Uh, but the question then remains how that model sustains itself under the kind of reaction that would also produce. Thank you. Anyone? Can I ask to, <laughs> it's Julie. So maybe not ask, but some ideas. Basically those models, they, they could be presented as a certain way of progress or some modi positive modification. But on the other hand, they are better presented as modification of a conflict like it's different the conflict that is constitutive that constitutes the positive sides of each each model and then they're just different ways of being in conflict for example and between different elements some some conflict that sustains it like in with the one the model where administration hits the hero that resembles SES uh, it's still there is a conflict normally between uh, administration faculty and students but the positive positive part of it that it unites this conflict unite faculty within itself and being against the external to it someone external to it someone who is not involved in research and it unites students maybe with the faculty so uh, instead of uh, students being disunited with the faculty so just interesting i'm just trying to to develop recently because i'm forced to write paper <laughs> trying to develop this idea of negative pedagogy and trying to think about the negative sides, including conflicts as constitutive for pedagogy for universities. Mm -hmm. So in, it's just interesting to think about those models, probably something you're supposed to do too. think uh, about them in terms of conflicts and in terms of being different kinds of conflict and not being just worse or better, but you know, having those good sides, bad sides, uh, specific to them, but being constituted all of those bad and good sides as uh, dialectics of mm -hmm. yeah. nature, conflict nature. That's, that's definitely what I had in mind in presenting this um, to think, because you're, you've been talking about education, you know, philosophically, and one can do it philosophically in a very abstract sense, which in my PhD program, that's what was done. And I found that very dissatisfying. You could also do it historically in a very grounded sense where you don't make any kind of big claims about the university, but just talk about how it develops. But I was trying to sort of, yeah, build in a kind of dialectical mode of thinking where you look at those sites of crisis and conflict, and those are very interesting places to examine because that's where 
again, ideals are working themselves out in concrete historical situations, which then feed back into how those ideals are then uh, taken up, you know, and modified in different ways. Um, so engendering that kind of dialectical thinking, I'm making the claim is, is a, a good way to think about, um, yeah, pedagogy or all the things you've been studying in this course. Yeah, thank you. But can we still think about improvement, like improved version, even if we think uh, about those models in those terms? What would be improvement? But for me, improvement would be, but it's a lame improvement. Improvement would be embracing conflict instead of trying to build the model that would avoid the conflict, like deal, figure out the better way of being in conflict. Yeah. The more maybe not productive, but more interesting. Modify the conflict, not modify the uh, something, the model to get rid of conflict mm -hmm. because it's unrealistic. Right. And there might be just something uh, I mean, you just go all the way back to Plato, you know, there's, there's something about conflict that's necessary for education to occur. And one of the maybe worst features of this corporate model is that corporations think that removing conflict for the purpose of increasing efficiency is the right way to run an institution. And that just doesn't work in a university. Um, so I'm totally with you that it's learning how to, I don't know, sit in within conflict or um, not freak out at the first instance of conflict and think about the second to, one only. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I take, I, I'm totally in that spirit. Um, but then there's also, I mean, there's just whether, I mean, improvement such a loaded term um, because universities are also just they're involved in a kind of crisis that's more general in society, uh, what we might call a legitimation crisis where people have lost faith in them. Um, and sometimes for quite good reasons. I mean, here in the United States, the amount of debt that students end college with is obscene and crippling for, for, for their life prospects. Um, and universities have been involved in investing in you know, some of the worst uh, like extractive industries um, and have displaced poor people through gentrification around the campuses. Like there are also ways that improvement means the university does need to be coming back to Nastia's point a little bit directly addressed, you know, and saying you're, you're a bad actor in these senses. Mm -hmm. Improvement is neoliberal concept. Yeah. Yes. Right. <laughs> Let's make it worse. <laughs> Anyone else? Hello, Professor. I'm Yulia. I'm a second year student. And I would like to come back to your thought experiment because we haven't discussed it yet. Mm, in my opinion, we should focus on uh, not the differences between models of uh, universities but what actually they uh, have in common like uh, i can imagine that uh, students uh, still do kind of research projects undergraduate thesis like uh, at sas and uh, traditional universities in russia uh, then the process of education no matter is it a uh, uh, kind of uh, free curriculum, liberal arts education, or again, a traditional one, uh, the tasks might be similar, uh, like, uh, I don't know, reading and writing, and the lectures and seminars. And uh, uh, of course, uh, not to forget to mention that uh, we have uh, different uh, faculties, like what are, what is the, the specialization uh, of uh, student groups uh, and uh, the hierarchy, the structure might be similar as well. Like we have administration, professors from uh, various uh, scientific fields uh, and uh, students um, and uh, um, as you can imagine, 
we have uh, the same uh, details, uh, so it might be not so difficult to imagine at least uh, uh, a schema of uh, the universe. I don't know, the model might depend on the country, but I'm not an expert in this sphere, so I cannot elaborate on this topic. Mm -hmm. I would like to hear your opinion on that uh, experiment, if you yeah. don't mind. Yes. Um, I mean, I, you're very right that different countries have very different traditions that uh, would make the university look slightly different from place to place. Um, but in the era that we live in now, and the fact that I'm here in the US talking to you, you have such an international faculty at SAS. Uh, and the model of the sort of these models circulate around the world in ways that they didn't before creating a lot more similarities than differences. So I think you're right to focus on similarities, but then what you can do is try and find instances where you would ask yourself, like, is it still a university if we took away uh, something? So like, does a university need a library, for example? You know, you have a library at SAS, but it's not full of books for, you know, various reasons. You have the one at UTMM, you can depend on, but could there be a university without a library? Um, here in the United States, there were some schools for budget reasons that cut programs in philosophy or in classics like Latin and Greek. And people ask the question, are we still a university if we don't have a philosophy department? Uh, so maybe it's by nature of subtracting things that you really start to get these tests of, um, well, like what, what, what essential features need to remain for it still to be a university? And if you take certain central features away, is it more helpful to describe it as something other than that? Anyone else? No. Then we will let you go. No, okay. <laughs> One last question. Yep, uh, it's Alina again, and that's not a question, but it's a, a small remark uh, on the universities and models and what is the university. And I believe that an important component of like current crisis of university is also uh, the like the huge development of on online learning which also problematize the traditional university because we have not only like online professional courses right now, but we have like a, almost the online university in, in which you can like uh, make a set of different disciplines and complete it and then gain some diploma or a certificate or something like that. And I believe it's a big question. What is like, is it, a university in in some philosophical or historical sense and if, what is the crucial difference between it and like traditional university with a building at least and some professors that we can see uh, and know their faces at least uh, and also uh, i believe it's also problematized the traditional university as an institution in the modern world because while we are striving, while we are still living in a capitalist, uh, capitalistic system and we are striving for some profession to have, uh, it's still interesting, like, do we need the traditional university now? And why do we need it? And how we, how we can justify it for ourselves in order not to be in a conflict, actually, with some modern capitalistic paradigm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. That's a great comment. I mean, if you were to say, well, what could you subtract from a university and still call it a university? Could you subtract an actual campus and still call it a university? I mean, that's the really weird situation that we found ourselves in uh, with the growth of you know, this modern communication technology and with the pandemic forcing universities to go online. I would just say, Anecdotally, I don't know if you had the same experience. We taught online 
or in some hybrid form for most of last year. And most faculty would tell you it was a deeply unsatisfactory experience. And most students would probably say the same thing. Um, maybe that's something that it's just a period of adjustment and eventually people will become more comfortable with that idea. Uh, but certainly anecdotally, people didn't describe learning or research or any of the things that are attached with the university as having um, sort of been successfully achieved in this fully online form. So it's a great question. Obviously, a lot of energy is there. It remains to be seen whether it's something that might emerge as a new model, a totally deterritorialized university. Thank you, Mike. We will let you go. Okay. Thank you for the lecture. It was amazing, and we re really miss you here. Yes. Us especially. <laughs> well, Nasia and Irina and other students, it's great to see you all again. Uh, very excited for you to graduate at some point soon. And uh, yes, hopefully someday I'll be able to come back and visit SAS. Bye. Okay. Bye, everyone.